Hello and welcome. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Shelley Klein, the Historian and Director of Education at the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education. Thank you for joining us for this evening's uh, talk. Um, tonight is another one of our uh, speaker series and our Auschwitz speaker series, and we are joined uh, by uh, George Schiello, who is the um, President and CEO of Union Station Kansas City, our partner in um, this um, exhibit. And George, would you like to say a few words about our partnership and um, the exhibition here in Kansas City? Well, thank you, Shelley. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be uh, here with our group tonight as we continue our program to educate our community, have a deeper understanding of the Holocaust and to support the efforts and energy and mission of the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education and their commitment to allow us to bring this international exhibition to Kansas City. I always like to talk about how successful it is and I, I will do that. I'll start off right now because I know many of the participants are so interested in this topic and have been advocates to continue to tell the story that we must tell. But I'm pleased to inform the community that as of today, over 130,000 people have purchased tickets in a very short four weeks, unheard of in Kansas City history. And when we know of the Jewish population, this only says how important the entire community is embracing this topic and the mission of Midwest Center for Holocaust Education, and most importantly, those that were killed in the Holocaust. You know, it's nice to talk a little bit about the results and the, and the numbers of people, but it's not only measured by numbers, it's measured by the impact that we collectively are having on Kansas City and our region to tell the story, to change our world. But I thought I'd just share with you, we've taken some surveys and in the recent surveys that we've had in the four weeks, uh, we measure success by a net promoter score. And we have received a 100 on a net promoter score, which is unheard of in the business community and in any type of action. So that tells us the quality of exhibition. And we, when we think about the general assessment, it is now at 9.2 out of a 10. So it's far exceeding anything we have ever done. But, and typically people are spending well over two hours and 50% of the individuals are spending nearly three hours in the exhibition. And when we look about how they've heard about it, it's mostly coming from social media. And would you tell a friend to tell you to join? And that's where we're seeing the nearly 100% return on our net promoter score. But I think and this relates to the efforts of Jessica and Shelley and all of the board and the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education. We asked her one quick question. Would you agree or disagree with you learning more by this exhibition about the Holocaust? Nearly 67% have said they have learned more and understand a greater understanding of the Holocaust. And then would you, it says, um, what degree uh, do you believe you've learned new important information to the community? 92%. So these numbers are unheard of in statistics. So I hope what we have collectively done with the Midwest Center of Holocaust Education has now fostered the mission and the goals even greater. And this is a perfect example of our partnership. Many more things are coming, but tonight we are very fortunate to be a part of this exhibition. So Shelly, Jessica, I will turn it back over to you to introduce our great partner tonight to educate us on another topic. Thank you, George. Before I uh, introduce our speaker, I'd just like to remind everyone we're in webinar form. So if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please put them in the Q&A. At the end, I'll moderate a discussion with Dr. Bergerson and we can, we can get to some of those questions. Um, and tonight's presentation is also being recorded. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Andrew Stewart Bergerson, who is a professor at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. He has been a longtime friend and partner of the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education. He's now on our board. He was a founding member of our uh, roundtable for Holocaust educators in the region. Um, so it's been a pleasure to work with him for many, many years, and I look forward to hearing and learning from him tonight. Dr. Bergerson.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Jessica and Shelley and George for inviting me to speak today. I just want to warn folks that I'm, I'm communicating with you here from New York and there's about to be a thunderstorm. So hopefully the presentation will go well. So um, Shelley, if you would uh, go from the title page to the second page. Um, my friend, Bill Timaeus, asked me a question recently. What would you want people to get out of the Auschwitz exhibition? Bill is an independent journalist here in Kansas City. Together with my rabbi, Jacques Kukiakorn, they wrote a very readable book entitled, They Were Just People. In it, they tell the story of ordinary Polish people who rescued their Jewish friends and neighbors from the Holocaust. They even include a number of stories from survivors who subsequently lived here in Kansas City. Next slide. Let me begin to answer his question by telling you what I would not want people to get from the exhibition. I would not want visitors to imagine that all they need to do to protect themselves and their society from fascism, racism, and anti-Semitism is to attend this exhibition and learn about Auschwitz. Factual knowledge alone has not and never will be sufficient to protect us from new mass atrocities directed against Jews and other people. We have to apply that knowledge. Next slide. I believe that we should engage in respectful comparison between the Holocaust and other genocides, ethnic cleansings, and mass atrocities. Comparison has personally helped me to rethink my own research about the early stages of the Holocaust. It can help us to better understand each of these individual cases and all of their horror. Most importantly, comparison can help us to identify fascism, racism, and anti-Semitism in the present and prevent genocides in the future. Next slide. But more than anything else, I do not want the people visiting this exhibition to treat this or any mass atrocity as an extraordinary event perpetrated by people who are radically different from you and me. It is very easy to dismiss Nazi perpetrators as ideological monsters. Yet we know that many of the Nazi collaborators were motivated by far more mundane motives. Consider the motive of careerism. One archetype here is Lenny Riefenstahl, the filmmaker who promoted Nazi ideas under the guise of making art. Ironically, her focus on advancing her career prevented the filmmaker from thinking seriously about the fascism and racism that she was glorifying in film. Next slide. The same could be said of Nazi perpetrators. The archetype here in this case is Adolf Eichmann, Eichmann planned and implemented the transportation of millions of Jews from around Europe to the gas chambers and was proud of his organizational accomplishments. Using Eichmann as a model, the philosopher Hannah Arendt coined the phrase, the banality of evil. It describes the all too familiar habits of modern bureaucrats who so identify with their own work and efficiency that they never question the ethics of their institutional goals. To be sure, Eichmann and Riefenstahl took their direction from Nazi ideology, but their motives for doing their job well were not too different from yours or mine. As important as Auschwitz was to the Holocaust, sorry, that's the next slide, uh, it would be a mistake to reduce the Holocaust just to those killing facilities or even to the camp system as a whole. It would be more accurate to say that no the Nazis perpetrated multiple mass atrocities, torturing and killing their victims in a wide range of ways. In many cases, the perpetrators slaughtered their victims face to face. Some 3000 members of the mobile killing squads called Einsatzgruppen murdered more than 1 million people using bullets, shooting their victims at close range and watching the bodies pile up in large pits. Similarly, guards in the death camps regularly engaged in excessive violence, meaning violence that exceeded the guard's instructions and training. Holocaust survivor Primo Levi referred to it as useless violence because it did not seem to him to serve any utilitarian purpose. Next slide. Scholars have offered several explanations for this excessive violence. Some argue that it derived from the barbarization of German soldiers during the war, while others trace it to an ideology of eliminationist anti-Semitism. Scholars also disagree on whether those values existed in German pre political culture independent of the Nazis or were introduced by Nazi propaganda and institutions. 
Still other scholars point to interpersonal factors among the killers that encouraged these far more direct and gratuitous forms of violence. Here I would point to the research of historian Shelley Klein, who is the public historian and director of education at the MCHE, and Elissa Mylander at Sciences Po in France. Studying women guards in death camps, they argue that these ordinary people directed excessive violence at prisoners to show their fellow guards that they could do their job well. That all said, next slide. Most of the perpetrators did not know their victims personally. Oops, I think you're ahead. Yes, I think that's right. Uh, most of the Nazi perpetrators did not know their victims personally from before the war. By contrast, every Jewish person who was murdered in the death camps or by the Einsatzgruppen had been friends or neighbors with Jewish people at one time. Today, I would like to take a step back from both the mobile killing squads and the death camps to the communities in which Jews had lived before deportation. I would like to talk about the role of ordinary people in initiating what political scientists Jeffrey S. Kopstein and Jason Wittenberg have called intimate violence. Intimate violence refers to the kind of violence that takes place between people who had coexisted in the same communities with some degree of civility. Using the scholarly books listed on the bottom of your screen as points of reference, I will answer four questions today relating to intimate violence. How did friends and neighbors turn into Aryans and Jews? Why did some people begin attacking their Jewish neighbors? What made some communities more resilient such that they did not collaborate in these mass atrocities? And how might we build more resilient communities today? Next slide, please. Let me begin with the driving forces of these mass atrocities. In every genocide, the perpetrators justify their mass murder by labeling the victims as not only dangerous, but also not fully human. During the Holocaust, Nazi propaganda combined traditional forms of anti-Semitism with more modern concepts of racism and social Darwinism. To be sure, anti-Semitism for Hitler was an end in itself. He believed that he would strengthen the Aryan race by removing Jews from it. But it was also a means to two political goals that were central to the Nazi program, nation building and empire building. Next slide, please. In their ideal form, modern nation states consist of one government representing one ethnic group. So for instance, the French nation state would include all French people and only French people in the territory over which it was sovereign. The problem with this fantasy is that the ideal of the nation state has never existed at any time in any place in human history. Nation building refers to the political process of imposing this sovereign government and dominant culture onto the hodgepodge of human populations and attitudes. Nation building requires a massive reorganization and homogenization of people. Nation builders act like gardeners, encouraging the growth of a monoculture while discouraging the human inclination towards ecological diversity. It should not surprise us then when gardeners of the nation sometimes resort to poisoning the people who they consider to be weeds. Remember that the gas used at Auschwitz was a pesticide. Next slide, please. But this garden metaphor misrepresents ordinary people as too passive in the nation building process. The nation as an imagined community it requires regular performances by ordinary people in order to keep that fiction alive. Ordinary Germans performed an Aryan nation when they marched through their hometown wearing Nazi uniforms, in this case, in the town of Hildesheim. Such local performances were not primarily designed for foreigners to see. The performers hoped to convince their fellow Hildesheimers so to support the new political fictions of this new Third Reich. They were reimagining the German people as a culturally and racially superior people 
called Arians. Next slide, please. I want to draw your attention to the public quality of these performances of the nation. These uniformed Nazis sent a carefully orchestrated message to political enemies like communists and social democrats and union leaders who opposed the Nazi regime. This message announced that they could be beaten, arrested, and tortured if they resisted. In light of Hitler's overt anti-Semitism, these performances also sent a clear message to Jews that they were no longer welcome in their own neighborhoods. And after the Nazi seizure of power in 1933, these early Nazi supporters communicated to their neighbors that they now held power and status in their communities thanks to their party connections. So it would be a mistake to imagine that Hitler and the Nazi party imposed their vision of a German nation onto ordinary Germans as passive objects of a totalitarian policy. Ordinary Germans transformed themselves into Nazis in front of their neighbors to lay claim to the power and status of the Nazi revolution. Next slide, please. Historian Mark Levine has argued that modern nation building is one of the driving forces behind genocide, precisely because building a nation requires such a radical restructuring of self and society. It was a common feature of everyday life in the quote unquote shatter zones of empires. Shatter zones refer to those regions of prior empires that were inhabited by mixed populations. The archetype here, as you can see on the map, is East Central Europe, after the collapse of the Habsburg, Hohenzollern, Russian, and Ottoman empires in 1917 and 1918. To create their nation states, nation builders in this situation engaged in what's called ethnic unmixing. The current and ethnic and religious, ethnic and religious conflicts in the Middle East can be understood as an ongoing consequence of this same process of ethnic unmixing. In these shatter zones of empires, competing projects for nation building among ethnically and religiously mixed populations created mass atrocities ranging from wars and ethnic genocides, ethnic cleansings to genocides. Indeed, traditional wars and even ethnic cleansings can develop into genocides when the majority population feels threatened by the minority, when the minority resists unmixing, or if there is no way or no place to which the minority can escape. Next slide, please. German nation building began in the shatter zone of the Holy Roman Empire that was destroyed by Napoleon in 1806. Over the course of the 19th century, German nationalists were largely successful in redrawing state boundaries and changing the way many speakers of the various German dialects identified. By 1900, most Catholics and Protestants, Bavarians and Saxons, workers and entrepreneurs, and women and men and children came to think of themselves first and foremost as German. But even after the unification of Germany in 1871, the new German nation state still did not fit the imagination of German nationalists. They believed that many Germans who lived outside of this Second Reich belonged within their nation state, and other people who lived within the Second Reich did not belong in it because they were not German. Next slide, please. The Third Reich realized these political fantasies in a far more extreme form. The Nazis defined people not according to their culture or their language, which could be altered, but according to allegedly immutable eugenic features, which required sterilization, physical deportation, and extermination. Racial purity was demonstrated through both inclusion and exclusion, to receive a racial passport called an Anenpass, ordinary Germans had to verify that their genealogy was free from Jews and handicaps. Only if they were racially pure 
Were Aryan women rewarded for having racially pure babies? The Nuremberg Laws of 1935 defined citizenship by excluding Jews and outlawing sexual relations between Jews and Aryans. By the way, the Nuremberg Laws also introduced, for the first time in German history, a single flag for the German nation state, the Nazi swastika. Next slide, please. At this point, it is worth clarifying what is meant by the term Reich. Depending on the historical situation, it can be translated into English in many ways as realm, empire, state, and nation state. Although we often presume that nations are supposed to replace empires, the term Reich epitomized the ways in which the political project of nationalism and imperialism can so easily intersect and reinforce each other in practice. For instance, Hitler famously promised to rebuild Germany by breaking with the Treaty of Versailles. Between 1933 and 1939, he first restored or acquired full sovereignty over numerous territories that were inhabited either in whole or in part by ethnic Germans, including the Saarland, the Rhineland, Austria, the Sudetenland, and the Memel territory. This can be understood as nation building. But with the conquest of Bohemia and Moravia, the Nazis began extending German rule over large populations of non-Germans. In other words, nation building began to translate into empire building. Next slide, please. In terms of geopolitics, Hitler drew lessons from World War I. For his Third Reich to thrive, he believed that he needed to be completely self-sufficient in resources, such as minerals, petroleum, and food. Rejecting Wilhelm II's dream of a naval empire, he tried to build a vast land empire across the Eurasian continent, first in order to occupy and exploit it for its resources, including using its inhabitants as slave labor. Drawing his inspiration in part from the history of the Americas, he imagined the gradual disappearance of Slavic, Jewish, and Roma Sinti populations, either through deportations or extermination. He planned to settle these territories with both ethnic Germans from other parts of Europe and new settlers from Germany proper. In his mind, only after Germany secured this continental empire would the German nation be safe for the next thousand years. Only with a secure continental empire would Germany be ready to compete with the United States for world dominance. Nation building and empire building were thus inextricably linked in Hitler's vision for the future. Next slide, please. Genocide was inherent in Germany, mil German military planning. During the invasion of Poland, the Nazis did not institute a normal occupation regime. They used terror to maintain order against a population that they presumed would resist as partisans. Mobile killing squads were first introduced here with permission to shoot on sight anyone who seemed like a partisan, including Polish leaders and increasingly Jews. During the attack against the Soviet Union, the German military planned for the systemic starvation of millions of Belarusians, Russians, and other people. The purpose of this starvation strategy was to supply the German army from the occupied territories, redirect the war economy to benefit Germans back home, and reserve enough men and material to defeat the world's largest land army. Here too, Einsatzgruppen were employed just below, behind the front lines to exterminate communist leaders and Jews who blended into one Judeo-Bolshevik enemy in the mind of Nazi ideologues. The death camps, next slide please. The death camps stood at the heart of this genocidal war in terms of both the internal homogenization of an Aryan nation and the external conquest of an Aryan empire. Auschwitz-Birkenau specifically was a factory complex 
as much for war production using slave labor as for the mass destruction of the Jews of Europe, in, along with many Poles, Roma Sinti, and political prisoners. The Holocaust was thus part and parcel of a long-term global political project for German nation and empire building that sought to homogenize the Aryan race internally and expand it externally. Next slide, please. I have come to see the nation and empire building as core factors driving the Holocaust, in part due to my reading in comparative genocides. Consider, for instance, the systematic destruction of the indigenous peoples in the colon Spanish colonial empire in the Americas. In his 2008 monograph, historian Aitan Ginsberg traces the birth of the modern Spanish nation state to the reconquest called the Reconquista of the Iberian Peninsula in the late Middle Ages. He argues that this nation building process laid the foundation for violent empire building in the new world. The conquistadors transposed their religious fanaticism, their ethnic hatred, and above all, their greed for land and gold from Europe to the Americas. These passions encouraged them to remove Native Americans from their land, enslave them on Spanish owned farms, work them to death under particularly brutal conditions in mines, destroy their culture in the name of Christianizing them, and exterminate them outright in so-called pedagogical massacres. Next slide, please. Many Native Americans died from illnesses brought inadvertently by the Spanish to the Americas. This too constituted genocide because of the way that all of these other policies, cultural genocide, slave labor, loss of land, forced relocations and pedagogical massacres, they all made Native Americans particularly susceptible to disease. Here I follow the definition of genocide proposed by sociologist Helen Fine, who does not require verbal or written intent for there to be genocide. All that is required for genocide is simply a series of what she calls purposeful actions that would obviously lead to the same outcome. In the case of the Holocaust, we do not limit the status of victims only to the people murdered directly by bullets or in gas chambers. Like the people seen here in the mass graves at Bergen-Belsen, we certainly consider the Jews who died indirectly from disease, malnutrition, or starvation as victims of genocide as well. Next slide, please. Ginsburg shows that the Habsburg court was fully aware of the inhumane practices of the conquistadors. At times, they tried to prevent its most egregious excesses. Yet in the end, the court effectively promoted cultural and physical genocide by refusing to punish the Spanish settlers. Moreover, the settlers operated with officially sanctioned impunity. Comparison to the Holocaust here reminds us that genocides are driven not by the policies of political leaders from above only, but also by the actions of ordinary people on the ground. Over the centuries of Spanish colonial rule in the Americas, these atrocities constituted intimate violence. The Spanish settlers lived in close proximity to Native Americans, yet they continued to exploit, relocate, and exterminate them. Their victims were not anonymous strangers. They were neighbors. Next slide, please. Recent scholarship on California continues this story of intimate violence. As initial Spanish colonization was replaced by US colonization and then California statehood, empire building once again overlapped and intersected with nation building. The various settlers of European ancestry relied on native Californians for labor and know-how, interacting with these neighbors in work, trade, and everyday life. Yet they dehumanized native Californians, stole their land, 
and forced them into systems of de facto slavery out of a toxic obsession with greed and faith in manifest destiny. Moreover, loss of land itself constituted a form of cultural and physical genocide for Native Americans because land was central to their physical and spiritual lives as a people. Yet Californian settlers perpetrated this intimate violence against their neighbors with impunity. They were aware of and responding to state and federal policies, but they acted with relative autonomy on the ground. Next slide, please. We see a similar pattern of greed in the case of the Nazis. Philosopher Moish Postone interpreted Auschwitz as a factory designed to extract use value from the bodies of Jews. Consider, for instance, all of the stolen property shipped from the death camps back to Germany and all the gold removed from the teeth of gas victims that the Nazis used to buy more gas. Consider as well the wholesale theft of art, businesses, jobs, homes, factories, and farms across the continent by Nazis and their collaborators. This story of insatiable greed began in Germany in the 1930s with the Aryanization of Jewish property. That is to say, global policies of nation and empire building began as intimate forms of violence between friends and neighbors. Next slide, please. <coughs> How is it that people could come to steal from, deport, and kill the Jews they knew? It begins, I would argue, with what historian Brendan Lindsay called, in passing, a genocidal atmosphere. Prior to the actual killing, public and private actors collaborated to create a situation in everyday life that lends itself to mass murder. Key factors here are the dehumanization and social isolation of the victims, a combination of both social pressure and rich rewards for the collaborators, as well as official encouragement and or promises of impunity for the perpetrators. But my current thinking on this question has been influenced by the philosopher Elaine Scarry, who wrote a landmark book on how we write and speak about bodies in pain. Following her, I would argue that the piles and piles of hurt, maimed, and killed human bodies required some kind of political fiction to justify them. Next slide, please. That is where the project of nation and empire building comes into play. What they offered a vision of self and society sometime in the future in a st state of status, power, wealth, and justice, and, and justice that then justifies the killing of innocent victims as a historical necessity. Historian Alon Confino described this process in the case of Nazi Germany in his 2014 book, A World Without Jews. The Nazis promised to expand the living space, Lebensraum, of the German people by conquering a continental empire, freeing it of Jews, Slavs, and other people currently living there, and settling it with Aryans. The Nazis promised a thousand-year Reich that would not only extend Aryan security and prosperity into the future, but it even rewrote the German past to purge its history of Jews. This political vision justified murder because it promised to free the German people from the shackles of Versailles, from encirclement, and from an imagined Jewish world conspiracy. Next slide, please. In 1933, Hitler had still not yet worked out the details of just how the Nazi regime would create this world without Jews. Still, Confino documents how ordinary Germans took it upon themselves to begin working towards that vision for the Aryan race in their everyday lives. In the country that led the world in the scholarly study of the Bible, the Nazis funded revisionist theologians who tried to remove the Old Testament from the Bible and reinvent Jesus as an Aryan. 
in the country that invented the book. They staged public book burnings for the literary and political works of communist social democrats and Jews. During these public rituals, ordinary people ripped, stomped on, and rode over Torah scrolls that contained the Jewish parts of the Bible. To be sure, these acts of largely symbolic violence um, were at this point not physical. They weren't killing people in the numbers that they will in the 1940s. But Confino emphasizes the fact that these initial public performances broke major taboos about how you treat your neighbors with civility and what it means to be a cultured person in Germany. It also, it was also during these Pueblo performances that ordinary Germans began acting like Aryans for the first time. Ordinary Germans laid claim to the right to conquer a continental empire for Germany that would last a thousand years by symbolically purging their libraries of socialist and Jewish books. Next slide, please. Much of my research, my early research, focused on this question of how friends and neighbors transformed into Aryans and Jews. In my 2004 book, Ordinary Germans in Extraordinary Times, which I've recently revised and translated into German in 2018, I studied the everyday cultural practices of friends and neighbors. I focused my study on the provincial town of Hildesheim, which is in what is today Lower Saxony. I showed that ordinary Hildesheimers adapted their practices of friendship and neighborliness to Nazi principles. To be sure, they acted within a genocidal atmosphere created by the Nazi regime, but they acted relatively autonomously and very much with their own status, power, wealth, and freedom in mind. Next slide, please. Consider the example of a neighborly greeting. Hildesheim in the 1920s was a civil society. Citizens treated all of their neighbors with respect, regardless of differences in politics, religion, occupation, wealth, or status. Hildesheimers publicly performed this civil society by greeting each neighbor with a formal guten Morgen, good morning, every time they met whether they encountered each other in the stairwell, on the street, in a shop, or while walking around the walls of their town. This ritual involved not only the exchange of words, names, titles, and pleasantries, but also bowing and tipping one's hat and looking each other in the eyes and shaking each other's hand. Next slide, please. My interview partners, who grew up in the first decades of the 20th century, insisted universally that a proper greeting was mandatory for all neighbors. Failing to greet made you an enemy. In one of my favorite anecdotes, one Hildesheimer told me that she lived on the same block as a prostitute and also with a flasher. To be sure, her piously Catholic mother instructed her to distance herself from them, but not before giving her neighbors a proper greeting. Here it is perhaps worth remembering that the Weimar Republic was a period of high political tension, sometimes breaking out into street violence. Arguably, Hildesheimers were so scrupulous about maintaining this everyday culture of civility because they wished to forestall overt political conflict. Accordingly, there were no major events of intimate violence in modern Hildesheim prior to the Nazis, even during the revolution of 1918. Their society was resilient, I argue, precisely because of this daily performance of civility among neighbors. Next slide, please. Meanwhile, ardent Nazis began introducing a new greeting that challenged this culture of civility. These early Nazi supporters thrust their chest out, put their arm out into space, extending their palm while pro pro proclaiming Hail to Hitler. In the image here, two boys are testing this greeting out with their schoolmates at a pub in Hildesheim. In the early 1930s, this aggressive stance often was often matched by a glare challenging one's interlocutors to similarly demonstrate their allegiance to Hitler. 
The Nazi greeting became one way to symbolically threaten anti-fascists and Jews with violence. Appropriately, the regime called it the German greeting because it was at this moment, hundreds of times a day, during each and every social interaction, that ordinary Germans were expected to demonstrate their Germanness. Next to the swastika flag, the greeting was the most visible public evidence of the unification of all Aryans into this imagined fascist, racist community that was called the Volksgemeinschaft. Next slide, please. In other words, there was a public, if largely symbolic debate in each and every German neighborhood expressed in terms of greetings and flags. At stake in this debate were competing visions for German nation and empire building. If you supported the international order, a democratic government, a civil society, a multi-ethnic religious community, then you greeted your neighbor with civility by saying good morning. If you supported breaking Germany out of the so-called chains of Versailles, restoring German territories to Germany with complete sovereignty, conquering Lebensraum such that the, Ger the Third Reich will last for a thousand years and purging socialists and Jews from that Aryan nation and empire, then you greeted your neighbor with Heil Hitler. Notice that ordinary Germans colluded with the Nazi regime in creating this genocidal atmosphere. They began by breaking fundamental taboos, in this case, the culture of civility. And before they engaged in genocide against the Jews that they did not know in Eastern Europe, these early Nazi supporters created a genocidal atmosphere through symbolic acts of violence against the Jews they knew. Next slide, please. The German greeted greeting created an ethical challenge for Jews and non-Jews alike that was as commonplace as it was persistent. When confronted by ardent Nazis building the Third Reich in their neighborhood, do you collaborate by greeting with Heil Hitler and make your anti-fascist or Jewish neighbors feel all the more like outsiders? Or do you resist with a resolute good morning and face the risk of social and physical retaliation from ardent Nazis or the party itself. This challenge was hard enough for people who were not very interested in politics. They might respond in one way in one situation and then another in the next. Next slide, please. But for a Jewish person or committed anti-fascist, this situation began to feel like what literary critic Lawrence Langer called a choiceless choice. Both Heil Hitler and Good Morning left them feeling like they no longer belonged to their own community. Some responded by making a joke out of the dilemma, like raising their hand only halfway and saying, so high, so high, to mock, the, mock, to mock the fact that Hitler was a small man, or saying Heil Schickelgruber, because Hitler's original last name sounds so funny even to Germans. Others just decided to act as if they didn't see their neighbor, and they walked on the other side of the street to avoid people running into people that they knew. Some isolated themselves in this way because they did not want to recognize the spread of national socialism in their own community. Others tried to protect their friends or neighbors from having to make this uncomfortable and perhaps costly political choice by isolating themselves. Next slide. But here's the rub. No matter what their reasons or their motives, these social interactions had the same effect. It progressively isolated Jews and anti-fascist Germans from their neighbors who were collaborating. Sociologist Zygmunt Bauman refers to this situation as social death. It marks a crucial stage in the creation of what I'm calling a genocidal atmosphere because social isolation made the victims all the more vulnerable to state-organized and political violence, uh, popular violence, excuse me. Bauman also notes that the Nazis were particularly skilled at what he calls soliciting the aid of victims in their own victimization. The Nazis created situations 
in which their victims made small, seemingly rational choices in the short term to cooperate with the perpetrators. But when seen in the long term, this series of choices became irrational in that they ultimately land the victims in places like Auschwitz-Birkenau. Here again, I want to emphasize that early Nazi supporters colluded with the Nazi regime to create this genocidal atmosphere by directing largely symbolic violence against the Jews they knew. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Political scientists Jeff, S., Jeff F. Kopstein and Jason Wittenberg asked a similar set of questions in their 2018 book, Intimate Violence, but they focused more on the physical forms of violence. In 1941, a series of pogroms took place in the eastern borderlands of Poland, a region called the Kresa. In 1939, after the Germans invaded Poland from the west, the Soviets invaded the Kresa from the east, as seen in this map. In 1941, the Soviets retreated out of the Kresa before the Nazis invaded. During this very brief intermezzo between, intermezzo between the two imperial armies, the residents of some of the towns in this region decided to attack their Jewish neighbors. Next slide. You are probably familiar with the most famous of these local pogroms, the one perpetrated in the town of Yedvapne and studied by Jan Gross in his book, Neighbors. The perpetrators of this pogrom were aware of Nazi anti-Semitism and they anticipated the arrival of the Nazis. So they believed they could attack their fellow, their Jewish neighbors with impunity. Yet people of different religious and ethnic backgrounds had lived together in these communities for centuries. Residents spoke Polish, Ukrainian, Ruthenian, Yiddish, some German, some Russian. They worshiped in Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches or in synagogues of many varieties. Yet not all of these ethnic towns in the Eastern borderlands experienced pogroms. Why did some communities resort to intimate violence and others did not? Kopstein and Wittenberg used a quantitative method to figure out which factors made multi-ethnic communities more resilient in the face of a genocidal atmosphere and which, made inter which factors made intimate violence between neighbors more likely. Next slide. So these authors argue that the key factor was the strong presence of competing visions for rival nation states. Some ethnic Ukrainians wanted to become part of an independent Ukrainian nation state. Some ethnic Poles wanted a purely Catholic, purely Polish speaking Poland. Other people like the current multi-ethnic society of the second, other people liked the multi-ethnic society of the second Polish Republic. Scholars distinguished not only between the towns where one or some or all of these groups were present, but also between towns where these rival political movements were particularly vocal in making their demands. Next slide, please. By the way, the Jews were even more divided, as I'm sure you've heard from, um, um, from a prior, prior talk. Um, some Jews liked the Republic the way it was, Others demanded political equality with Poles and Ukrainians or an autonomous region of Jews for Jews within these larger nation states. Still others called for the creation of a Jewish nation state in Palestine. And they often disagreed on whether those Jewish polities should be secular or religious. Kopstein and Wittenberg also make an interesting distinction between assimilation and integration. Some Jews, lived like everyone else, culturally and socially assimilated into Polish society. Others were integrated in the sense of maintaining friendly relations with their non-Jewish neighbors as customers, neighbors, and so on. But these Jews maintained their own independent Jewish milieu with its own customs, languages, institutions, and identities. As again, I'm sure you heard from the pre previous speaker, Dr. Franz Sternberg. 
Next slide, please. These scholars concluded that the most significant predictor of a pogrom was twofold. The presence of two or more large minorities who are relatively evenly matched in terms of population, and both of whom were organized into competing vocal nationalist movements. So if one group was committed considerably smaller in the town, or if that group was not actively demanding its own nation or its own autonomy, the town was less likely to see a pogrom. Their analysis borrows the concept of a power threat from sociologist Hubert Blalek. Kopstein and Wittenberg argue in effect that pogroms took place in towns where one group was large and vocal enough that their rival vision of a nation building posed a viable power threat to this other group's vision for their own nation building. This research seems to suggest that the tipping point between a genocidal atmosphere and actual genocide is thus the fear, whether it's justified or not, that your neighbor's group might threaten your group's hope for a future nation state. Next slide, please. <clears throat> By the way, European settlers often justified committing genocide against native populations in the name of self-defense because they anticipated violence from the native populations with or without any basis in reality. In his infamous speech in January of 1939, Hitler justified his own plans for a genocidal war by claiming that Germany was defending itself against the Jews. Quote, if international finance, Jewry, inside and outside Europe should succeed in plunging the nations once more into a world war, he prophesied, the result will not be the Bolshevization of the earth and thereby the victory of the Jews, but the annihilation of the Jews, Jewish race in Europe. As Confino has argued, we are not dealing here with a concrete plan for genocide, rather with a vision of a world without Jews to be realized in some way in the coming genocidal war for a continental German empire. Next slide, please. In my own research, I call these anticipatory memories. What I see Hitler doing here is inventing a convincing story about himself and society that justifies engaging in acts that most human beings would consider reprehensible, initiating a war of conquest and extermination. He is telling this story not just to convince his people to follow him, but to convince himself that he can invade and occupy other country, countries with impunity. I often find this kind of anticipatory self-justification in the letters and diaries of ordinary Germans. Obviously, this myth-making involves a lot of self-deception. Some ordinary Germans imagined that Hitler's speech showed the degree to which he was a man of peace. These myths were both powerful and dangerous because they were the mechanism by which ordinary Germans rewrote the story of themselves, making themselves into collaborators and perpetrators. Next slide. Kopstein and Wittenberg drew a secondary conclusion from their research that I would like to mention. Even though the evidence for it was much weaker, I do so because it hints at how we might build communities that are more resilient. Remember that these scholars drew a distinction between integration and assimilation. Both strategies involved strong bonds between Jews and their neighbors, but assimilation erased their social and cultural differences entirely, while integration allowed the Jews to maintain their own social and cultural milieus. Contrary to expectations, these scholars found that communities where Jews were well assimilated were slightly more likely to have a pogrom than communities where Jews were just integrated. In other words, integration without assimilation provided the entire community with some protection from intimate violence. It seems that resilient communities are those that maintain strong social bonds between individuals in different groups and yet validate and legitimize 
the existence of different cultural groups as equal members of that larger community. Next slide, please. These findings are consistent with my own research. Hildesheim was divided roughly between three milieus, the Protestant middle classes, the socialist working classes, and the Catholics. Adding on to this, of course, a fourth, much smaller milieu, the Jewish minority as well. Precisely because each of these milieus had different visions for how to rebuild the German nation in the wake of the First World War, most Hildesheimers carefully maintained everyday practices of civility to preserve their civil society. Even after the Nazis transformed Germany into a fascist and racist, racist Volksgemeinschaft, a few brave Hildesheimers strove to undermine this genocidal atmosphere by preserving long-standing relations with their Jewish or anti-fascist neighbors. The same could be said, by the way, of the ordinary Poles that were studied by Bill Timaeus and Rabbi Jacques Kukirkorn. Though Poles rescued Jews out of a wide range of motives, not all of which were noble, the fact is that these ordinary people chose to maintain social relationships across this cultural and religious divide. And these social bonds saved the lives of their neighbors. Next slide, please. Still, this conclusion creates a bit of a conundrum for us today. The ideal situation seems to be one in which the various social groups preserve the cultural identities of their group while nonetheless maintaining strong social relationships between and across those divides. In this imagined community, all of the different cultural traditions are valued as the shared inheritance of a multi-ethnic civil society. This vision for the United States is still shared by a majority of Americans today, just as it was actively promoted by many Europeans in the interwar years, including in the Weimar and Polish republics. Next slide. The problem comes when angry political voices like the Nazis offer an alternate vision of a homogeneous nation state, or even promote the theft of property or murder of their neighbors. If you are a person who's committed to a multi-ethnic society, you may feel obliged to publicly and vocally demonstrate your commitment to a multi-ethnic polity and a civil society. Yet according to Kopstein and Wittenberg, it seems to be, the more vocal you get in the defense of multiculturalism, the more the Nazis feel threatened, particularly by a multi-ethnic society because this multi-ethnic society contradicts their vision of ethnic or racial homogeneity and settler colonism, colonialism. Next slide, please. We know the rest of the story in the case of the Holocaust. The Nazis invented conspiracy theories to validate their fears. They broke the taboos of a civil society in order to claim freedom to commit murder. They invented myths to to about themselves to justify this violence behind which they disguised their lust for power, money, and status. They created a genocidal atmosphere through symbolic violence against Jews and socialists, which tipped more and more over the edge into physical violence. With blood on their hands, they became part of a criminal conspiracy from which it was nearly impossible to withdraw. That is, and that is the moment that they created institutions like Auschwitz, where they could pursue final solutions to the genocidal problem that they created. Next slide. How then do we challenge an opposed fascist and racist movements if in the very act of challenging them, we incite already fearful people to anticipatory violence? For me, the answer lies in how we respond. I would like to conclude my comments today with a concept from a wonderful collection of essays edited by Bashir Bashir and Amos Goldberg in 2018. Their collaboration is groundbreaking, is a groundbreaking effort to understand the transnational intersections between the Holocaust of the Jews and the Nabka of the Palestinians. They borrow the term empathic unsettlement from historian Dominic LaCapra. And to my mind, it has multiple interesting connotations. 
The word settlement refers directly to these political projects of nation and empire building that drive so many mass atrocities. The word unsettlement is more complicated. I think that Bashir and Goldberg use this neologism to refer not just to the restoration and rights of rights and property, to the people who have been killed or dispossessed in nation and empire building projects, whether they are Jews after the Holocaust or Palestinians after the Nabka or Native Americans for that matter. They also use the word unsettlement in the sense of an ongoing process of decolonizing our society and even decolonizing our sense of self. Unsettlement requires us to rid ourselves of the dangerous and deep-seated fantasies of national homogeneity and imperial domination. It requires that we replace these myths with multi-ethnic polities, civil societies, and a proactive identification with the diverse heritage of all of the inhabitants of our community. Next slide, please. This process of post-colonial unsettlement also has the connotation of being unsettling. It requires disrupting the stories we tell of ourselves and the histories we tell of our communities that erase or justify past crimes of systematic theft and murder. Crucially, Bashir and Goldberg seem to insist that when we engage in this work of unsettlement, we must conduct ourselves with empathy for precisely those other groups whom we fear the most, whose power threatens us the most. Empathic unsettlement is very hard work. It requires that we take responsibility for the purposeful actions that we performed individually or collectively that resulted in the harm of others. But when we do the work, the hard work of empathic unsettlement, we learn more about who we are in fact, precisely because we are connected in all sorts of intersectional and transnational ways to the very people we are taught to hate. Final slide. In 2019, 2011, I had the pleasure of publishing a book called The Happy Burden of History. In it, my co-authors and I ask questions, ourselves the question that we have discussed today. What do we want our students to learn from studying the Holocaust? What does it mean to take responsibility for the Nazi past and for the genocides of the present? We conclude that there is no one single ideal way to resist fascism, no universal vaccine to the hate to, for hate. How we respond depends on the intimate situations in which we find ourselves, when perpetrators pre present us with choiceless choices in an effort to solicit our aid in the victimization of ourselves and our neighbors. If Nazis thrive in breaking taboos of civility, anti-fascist work begins when we respond with courageous acts of performative empathy. This then is what I hope you will get from a visit to the Auschwitz exhibition. I hope you will be moved by the suffering of the victims of the Holocaust to make empathic unsettlement into your unconditional, universal, and proactive ethos of civic engagement. My proposal is that empathic unsettlement is not only the right thing to do in the face of our historical responsibilities to the victims, it is also the best way for us to build more resilient communities that are safe places for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bergerson. You've given us a lot to think about for everyone who's um, listening. If you wanna go ahead and put a question in the Q&A, we can take some of those at this time. Just to get us started, um, you know, the question of perpetrators or participation of ordinary individuals is obviously, some, obviously something I'm very interested in. I think it interests a lot of people. I wonder if you could maybe speak a bit more to the dangers of being overly simplistic when thinking about participation of ordinary individuals, be it at an at a active perpetrator level um, or even something more mundane. So, so one of the big things I've struggled against my whole career is words and the words like 
bystander, collaborator, perpetrator. These, these words give the false impression that we know everything that's going on inside of a person, like that a person's a perpetrator and every piece of them is a perpetrator. And some historians have tried to kind of quantify this and say, oh, how much of a Nazi? Were they a 25% Nazi or a 35% Nazi? And the reality is human beings don't really operate that way. So um, in the book that I wrote, The Happy Burden of History, with three other co-authors, we argued that, um, in fact, people move between political positions all the time. Ordinary people will say one thing in one situation and another thing in another situation. And, and that doesn't mean that they're being inconsistent. It means that they're responding to their circumstances. And they imagine that they're being utterly consistent, but in reality, what's happening is a kind of a dynamic reaction to those, those conditions. So we argue that since we are, and, and so it is entirely possible that even Jews could have done things that seemed to have been collaborating with the Nazis, and yet ultimately they were doing so in order to escape them. And that we would always consider that to be a rational choice on the part of Jews. And we should consider that a rational choice on the part of, of, of non-Jews as well to, to move between positions of collaboration and not. So this makes, this makes uh, explaining what goes on a little bit more complicated. But what I would argue is that um, it's in those situations that we actually have power. That's the moment where someone can respond since they are responding anyway. Why not respond with empathic unsettlement? Why not respond in a way that's recognizing the needs of all of the human beings in that environment. So I think there's a way that we can rethink responsibility and away from this kind of like uh, measuring, is this person or is this person not evil, right? Into this very, as if human beings even know themselves, which is not true. Most people can't even figure out themselves. How can we possibly read what they are from the outside and, and open the possibility that people could be changing and could be dynamic. Now, now, at the same time, you might say, well, but then why did the Nazis stick with the Nazis for so long, right? Why did the collaborators keep collaborating? That is not because they were, they were ideologically consistent. That was because they were involved in a criminal conspiracy. And it's very hard once you have blood on your hands to escape that, 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 that the, the Nazis created the situation where everyone was a co-conspirator in the genocide in small ways. So everyone had to keep up the lies and keep the system going. So that's a different problem. That's a, a thorny problem of a different nature. Somewhat related to that, could you speak a bit about um, you know, this process of changing from a relatively civil society to Nazi mentality and, and this relatively short time that this takes, um, could you speak to what accounts for that speed, both in the change and then perhaps a little bit about what happens after? So once this regime collapses, what then happens to the mindsets of, of those individuals? So, so I'll, I'll answer the second question first, right? So if so there you are, you're an ordinary German, and let's, let's just give them the benefit of the doubt. Let's say that they didn't, they didn't know about the gas chambers. Of course, they knew all about the concentration camps. They knew about the torture. They knew a lot. But let's assume for a moment that they led, led a relatively isolated life. And, and let's even give them, say that they only find out about the, the stuff after the war. In their mind, they can't, they still feel part of the criminal conspiracy because they remember walking down the street saying, Heil Hitler, and everyone knew that that meant that you wanted Jews. It was part of a vision to rid the world of Jews. So those initial symbolic steps to reinvent yourself as a fascist and as an Aryan were absolutely crucial in buying the collaboration of, the ordinary, of ordinary people in the whole system. So afterwards, you're going to deny that the Auschwitz took place, or you're going to deny that you knew information. It's all going to be read through this veil of your own responsibility, the blood that's on your hands, what you, how you treated your Jewish neighbor, how you treated the Jew that you knew. That's why I find this topic to be really important, because unless you get into this initial moment where those initial symbolic acts of violence then you're never going to understand why the, the, they stuck with Hitler through all those years, through all the disasters, and even afterwards, all the excuses after the war. Right. Um, any thoughts on the, the, the 
how rapidly this process took place? Or do you see it as rapid? Do you see it as slow? That most, might be a better place to most start. Most scholars right? would say it, that the, the Nazi seizure of power did not take place just in 1933. It took all the way to 1939. And I would agree with that. I think there was a gradual process. But one of the interesting consequences that came out of my research is um, what is an argument that I, I wish all my reviewers had picked up more, but they didn't seem to notice it. Um, so what happens if you're in the in the 1920s when you were greeting your neighbors or you were looking at what flags they flew during, you know, on holidays and things, you could very easily read their politics from symbolic acts of, of that they were presenting in, in town. So if the person had a top hat, that meant that they were middle class, they probably voted for a middle class party. If they had a, a worker's cap, that meant they probably voted for either the communists or the social democrats. And we can do this in the United States all the time. We can read other people. We can look at the way they dress, the way they behave and say, oh, I probably can guess what their politics looks like. So imagine a scenario where now everyone is greeting with this uniform greeting to demonstrate that they are, are part of the new system. And you can no longer tell whether they really are sincere Nazis or not. It creates fear and anxiety in the society. So what I argue in my book is that the reason why there was so much anxiety was not just because of the Gestapo and not just because of your neighbor denouncing you, but that you literally lost the ability to tell if your neighbor was really a real Nazi or not. So you spent really close looking for little clues. How, how high are they lifting their hand? How, how much are they puffing their chest out? It created a totalitarian atmosphere of terror just in this, these social interactions. So I would say that that came about, that was, that finally gets realized in its full measure by the 19, by the late 1930s, by 1930 and 1939. I think one thing, you know, that goes with this issue of transformation, and as a point you made in a, a previous talk you did for us um, back in the fall on collapsing democracy, rising fascism, is a good reminder of when the Nazi party is elected into power, they only get 37% of the vote. And I think there's a common misconception that we're always fighting against as historians of this period, that there was some sort of a landslide moment. Um, Wait, but of course, what, go ahead. No, no, which means that that actually the transformation of the society from a, I think this is where you were going, transformation of the society from a civil society into a fascist Volksgemeinschaft actually took place in everyday life. And it was ordinary Germans who were doing this in their interaction, spreading this message that there's this new vision for Germany and this new ratio, this national and imperial vision that they're all going to be participating in. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Great teamwork there. <laughs> um, could you give an example, even thinking in our, our own time, of something that would be um, empathic unsettlement? Like just a, a common thing that we could, we could do if we're seeing some something that is amiss, how can, how can we take action? I, 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 think, I think in everyday life, first of all, the first step of course is to build relationships across ethnic boundaries and religious boundaries, right? So uh, right now there's a lot of conflict between Christian, Jewish, Muslim, uh, social differences. Um, you know, there was, we spent a whole uh, decade in a war on terror. So reaching out to Muslim neighbors, explaining to them that they are welcome. Um, uh, a lot of, you know, Sikh families face a lot of prejudice because of their attire, their religious attire, that, that um, and they are often the victims of violence. There's been anti-Asian violence recently in the United States. There's been lots of anti-Semitism. And I think what we see is really clear demonstrations. My favorite demonstration of solidarity in the face of violence was actually in New Zealand. I think we've talked about this before. Um, after a mosque was attacked, um, a group of, uh, of New Zealand Maori uh, did the Maori dance. I don't know the name of it, uh, but they did it outside in front of the, of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of the mosque. And they made very clear that no one was gonna hurt their neighbors because their neighbors are their neighbors. And they don't have, they're not Muslim. They don't, they're not, uh, they, they, they don't wanna go into the mosque, but they're gonna defend their neighbors, right? I also reflect on uh, something that a, a Razi uh, man did once when I was at Cornell many years ago. There was a protest against apartheid, and there was a bunch of uh, of uh, 
uh, uh, protesters in a, a, a tent city on the middle of the quads of the university. And I asked this guy in a uniform what he thought of it. And he said, uh, as again, as a, a trainer of the future military, he said, I don't agree with the word these people are saying, but I will, I will lose my life. I will, I will die as needed to defend their right to say it. So I, I think there are ways for us to, uh, to proactively and publicly show that we want to live in a civil society. And I think this leads me perhaps to our, our final question here, thinking about um, the value of, you know, how you see looking at the Holocaust in a context of other genocides, um, rather than just a single unique standalone event, what can we learn by contextualizing? And you pointed to some of these other examples within this talk, um, but what, what's a takeaway value we can have of seeing it in context and bringing it into modern times? Well, I, as I said, I think that it allows us to to think both about the connections between genocides, but also the uh, or, or mass atrocities, but also to understand each of those mass atrocities better. So it, the, the purpose of having terms like genocide, ethnic cleansing, uh, mass shootings it is not to say we never want to say that the people who died are somehow less valuable than the other people who died. That's never the purpose. The U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum makes very clear that comparison is not designed to create um, uh, hierarchies of status for victimhood. The purpose of it is to understand why it happened. So for me, reading, spending the last year reading about a nation and empire building, reading in comparison comparative genocides enabled me to see very clearly the degree to which nation and empire building lies at the heart of so many of these projects and how that then can be connected to the work that's going on in politics today, this ethnic unsettlement, this, this final breaking of the racist structures of our society, the final breaking of the anti-Semitic, the anti-Jewish, anti all the, these different um, anti-gay, all of these different um, um, institutions that have existed so long and persist in our society. Uh, empathic and settlement is inviting us to, to, um, to truly change the way we, we think about ourselves. So I'll, I'll end with a great meme that I saw on Facebook recently. Um, the question was, what, what does it mean to be an anti-racist? Uh, and the answer was, well, imagine that you, um, that you inherited a hotel from a, um, a person who hated handicapped people, who really believed that handicapped people should all be, uh, should be removed from society or killed or whatever. Um, and this, this person, when they built the hotel, they built the entire hotel with steps instead of ramps. Now you buy that hotel and you are effectively still contributing to an anti to, to hurting those people because you bought the hotel, even though you don't believe those ideas. So, so empathic and settlement requires us to look at our houses and say, are we still maintaining certain practices that are perpetrating traditions that we did not invent for which we don't want to be responsible. And we need to then, it's gonna cost money because you gotta rebuild the house. You gotta rebuild the hotel. You gotta build the ramps so everyone can participate equally and we can build those resilient societies. I think that's what, for me, this year of, of working very intensely on comparative genocides with my students has taught me. Thank you for that. And thank you, Dr. Bergerson, for really nuancing and complicating our view of the behavior of individuals, both in historical context and, and bring it into our own time and having us take a closer look at our actions and possibilities. So thank you all. Thank you for that. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I'd like to remind everyone to uh, join us again on July 20th at 630 and for another Zoom presentation. This one is called Cities of Boundless Possibilities, Polish Jewelry Between the Wars uh, by Dr. Fran Sternberg. So another excellent presentation coming up. Um, thank you to our partners at Union Station um, and to everyone have a good evening. Thank you. <laughs>